assalamu alaikum students so this lecture is a continuation of our uh, kidney uh, renal related physiology lectures and today we start part 1 of a very important topic namely glomerular filtration rate in this lecture will be basically our objectives are three uh, we will look at what gfr actually is we'll define it Uh, with its uh, normal statistics uh, we'll uh, look at its clinical importance uh, then we'll discuss factors which affect it and uh, at the end of this particular lecture we'll be discussing uh, regulation of gfr uh, estimation of gfr along with the concept of clearance will be done in the second lecture so uh, first we need to see what gfr actually is and why is it important so gfr basically is a is a is a rate it's a mathematical expression of the filtration capability of kidneys and you need to understand uh, the main function of the kidney is to filter blood so that we get rid of uh, uh, the waste products and we reabsorb what is important for the body uh i've talked i've spoken about the word reabsorb and why don't we uh, mention absorb uh, in my previous lectures this is just to reclaim what uh, basically uh, got filtered out at the glomerulus so this being uh, the most important feature of kidney uh, it's uh, it's a quantitative assessment is uh, of paramount importance so for example uh, a person a has uh, a normal uh, filtration capability of the kidney while person b has uh, a disease of the kidney uh, in which the filtration uh, profile or the ability of the kidneys to filter uh, to filter out blood has decreased okay how do we know how do we report this to uh, the patient uh, to uh, to the other colleagues of ours what is the way to report it this is the way to report it so if we mention that person a's gfr is normal or person b's gfr is decreased or such and such as uh, gfr has increased so this is just to say just to comment on what the kidney is doing in terms of filtration and remember it all starts with filtration ultra filtration uh, so blood comes in, in uh, at the level of glomerulus it gets filtered out the plasma bit uh, we look at what ratios are there involved in a bit uh, and then when when the filtration has occurred and the filtrate has has uh, been formed and it hits the tubular network uh, then all sorts of reabsorptions and secretions and excretions happen but it all starts with filtration if you notice okay so the the kidney's ability to filter uh, blood is that main stay of the whole function of or the most prolific function of the kidney so uh, it's it's uh, of paramount importance that we understand the quantitative uh, expression of this filtration and this this expression is called the GFR glomerular filtration rate uh, since this word is here so you uh, you should predict that some sort of time stamp will be in that definition so all the filtrate that is formed by all uh, healthy or whatever uh, all nephrons basically of whatever status uh, because all nephrons are not the same really so we we say that all nephrons participating in filtration of uh, the kidney uh, per unit time it's conventional to say per minute uh, is called gfr the mean value is 125 ml uh, per minute which basically means 150 liters a day now uh, if if uh, you have this uh, mathematical mind uh, this is an interesting statistic this is a lot of stuff going through the kidney per unit time so in if you can see that uh, we have 5 liters of blood Uh, out of which about uh, 3ish liter is plasma why i demarcate is is because normally 
the cellular component of the blood is not does not participate in uh, and should not participate in filtration it's the liquid portion that is plasma so you can imagine uh, kidneys working at this rate 180 liters a day it's a, it's a serious uh, situation uh, serious uh, work quantitative work this means that the plasma of the entire body gets filtered out 60 times in a day or 20 uh, 24 or 25 times per hour okay uh, and another way to look at it is that uh, if you do not recapture reabsorb most of this filtered stuff in the tubule you'll be running out of plasma within 24 minutes this is another very interesting way of uh, looking at it i uh, a person will collapse uh, within 24 minutes if the tubule doesn't function because of the sheer amount of glomerular filtration okay so for this uh, to happen for for the kidneys to filter at the glomerulus uh, this amount of uh, of uh, filtrate uh, the the filter the kidney the, the glomerulus needs to be supplied uh, by this amount so 1100 ml per minute is the renal blood flow of which plasma is roughly half uh, 600 ml per minute so said in another way if 1100 ml and you you may find that it says 1200 in some books it, it varies so if this amount of blood uh, carrying this amount of plasma enters the glomeruli per minute you will get a gfr of 125 125 ml per minute okay now so this is one this is one aspect which uh, you need to remember and remember that this is a very common question uh, why was of kidney usually start uh, with this question uh, i've i've seen pay, uh, students messing up the values uh, or no, not getting the definitions right or the concept right and this is very very bad usually what happens is they say it's it's a, a rate of one nephron or just nephron and the examiner can ask is it one nephron is it one kidney and then you know the whole confusion starts so basically all nephrons per unit time is gfr and its mean value is around 125 ml per minute it does not mean that everyone has this exact same 125 ml per minute it's a it's an average it it can be 120 it can be 121 22 25 26 maybe but not very wild swings from this value okay another way of looking at it is this term called filtration fraction filtration fraction is uh, 0.2 or it's this another way of saying 20 percent of renal plasma flow what does it mean we mean to say that 20 percent of plasma which is entering the glomeruli gets filtered out while the rest of the 80 percent uh, is not disturbed this can be uh, viewed clearly in this diagram it's a very good diagram uh, so he has shown that plasma volume that is entering the afferent arteriole is let's say 100 percent so 100 100 units uh, enter the enter the afferent arteriole and go into the glomerulus now we know the ultrastructure of glomerulus is pro filtration right so under high pressure under high hydrostatic pressure we mentioned this one of the distinguishing features of the glomerular bed as compared to the other capillary networks of the body is that this features a higher hydrostatic pressure something which will come in today's lecture in, in, in another aspect as well so under high hydrostatic pressure uh, plasma gets filtered out how much 20 percent as we just said 20 percent this is the filtration fraction so out of say our uh, hypothetical 100 units of plasma if they're entering the glomeruli 20 units will be filtered out into the bowman uh, uh, space and on to the tubule while the rest of the 80 percent will not be disturbed and it will leave the glomeruli through the efferent arteriole 
and on to the pericapillary network and so on. Okay, so this is one thing. Remember, 20% is the filtration fraction, meaning 20% of plasma gets filtered out, 80%, and this is normal, and 80% basically leaves the efferent arteriole to join the peritoneal network and then eventually systemic circulation. It's given back to the systemic circulation. So at a time, it's the filtration fraction which the kidney works with, uh, and this 80% is spared. There's another way of saying it. Now what happens, what, what is the eventual fate of uh, this 20%? This is not the focus of our uh, studies here because we are right now at the level of the glomerulus, but just to complete the sequence, let's, let's just see what happens. So it enters the tubule, the tubular network, uh, the proximal convoluted tubule and so on and so forth. And look at this, more than 19% of fluid out of this 20 is reabsorbed. It's reabsorbed and it's given to the adjacent peritubular network. If you remember the anatomy, the functional anatomy, we spoke about this, that efferent arteriole then goes on to make the peritubular network, which runs closely alongside the renal tubule, okay? So this is that proximity, and this is why it's proximal. It's, it's uh, I beg your pardon, it's, uh, it's right next to it. Uh, it's uh, very close to it, because there are there is communication between this network and the tubule, which is running side by side. In this case, reabsorption is taking place, okay? So reabsorption means from the tubule into the peritubular network, okay? So uh, out of the 20% 20, 20 that we, we filtered out, the filtration fraction, 19% uh, goes back and only 1% is excreted out in urine. This is to complete the picture, all right? Hope this is clear. Okay, so uh, what is the importance of GFR? Uh, as I said, it's the measurement of the most prominent feature of the kidney and which is filtration, okay? Uh, clinically speaking, it's basically a prognostic marker of, dis of uh, any kidney disease. What is prognosis? Basically, prognosis, you must have heard this word and, and studied it in your first years. Uh, and this is, you, you read it in uh, reference to ESR, that ESR is a prognostic marker. It's not a diagnostic marker. What's the difference between prognosis and diagnosis? Diagnosis is when you can tell uh, when, a when a substance or a marker or, or a, a figure, a statistic is diagnostic. We mean that this shows what is exactly wrong with such a such and su such a such system or uh, such and such uh, organ. So we know the cause of disease. Prognosis, however, tells us something is wrong, but doesn't give us the exact picture. So when we say that GFR is is a pro is a prognosis is a prognostic marker, we are saying that when there is fluctuation in GFR. So if if you hear the statement that GFR in such and such patient has decreased or it has increased. Uh, you can safely say that something is wrong with this patient. What is wrong with this patient? GFR cannot tell you that. Okay, it can tell you readily that something is wrong, uh, which then will should prompt you to further investigate this patient. Okay, so this is what prognosis is. And in patients which you admit uh, who are serious and you admit them in your in the hospital, uh, GFR serial measurements of GFR will tell you whether your management is working in a beneficial way or it is not affecting the patient. So uh, on day one, if the GFR has been decreased by 50% and by two weeks of therapy of your, or, and your clinical management, if the GFR has improved uh, by say uh, 25%, then you, you should be confident that whatever you're doing, it's, it's, it's working in this patient. But if the if after if serial uh, GFR estimations show you that the 50% deficit of GFR is still there and it's not fluctuating really towards the better, then you need to adjust. Or if uh, God forbid it shows that now it's 75% loss of GFR, then you clearly can see that your therapy is not benefiting the patient either because the therapy itself is inappropriate or that the underlying disorder is very uh, quick or very aggressive so that some ma major changes to your uh, 
your therapy needs to take place. So this is where GFR fits in, in, fits in, in clinical practice. Okay. So now we look at uh, factors affecting GFR. This is an important UQ uh, and comes as such in your SAQ component of the exam. Okay. So I will assume that you know what this, these mean, Starling forces. Okay. So I'll just briefly jog your memory when you did circulation in first year. Uh, they talked about they must have talked about and you must have studied uh, the fact the forces acting across a typical capillary system okay so there are forces which would push the push the fluid out and there are forces which uh, want to keep the fluid in so if quickly you can you 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 can you can answer what would hydrostatic pressure of the capillary do is it a pro-filtration uh, force or anti-filtration force? If your answer is it's pro-filtration, you're right. It, it tends to force fluid out of the capillary. What about plasma colloid osmotic pressure or simply onphotic pressure? What does that do? Again, if you your answer is it's, it keeps the fluid in the capillary. So in that, in that sense, it's one of those forces which uh, goes against filtration. You are correct. These are the two forces which act across uh, all capillary membranes. And hence, uh, glomerular capillary membrane is no exception. In fact, here, the hydrostatic force is, is more than hydrostatic pressure elsewhere. So these are the stalling forces. Uh, which basically cause GFR, if you know what I mean. This is this is how uh, filtrate filtrate is is born, quote unquote, is formed. Okay, uh, these starling forces force fluid out, mainly the hydrostatic pressure, out of that capillary, and hence filtration fraction is formed. Okay. Now. How is filtration, uh, how, 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 what affects starling forces themselves? So once again, starling forces basically make GFR. They make the filtrate and they in turn get affected by the amount of renal blood flow that is coming in and our, uh, uh, afferent and efferent arteriolar resistance at any given time. So these two factors they affect starling forces and starling forces being the generator of gfr then affect gfr okay this is the sequence of events so when we when you are asked about factors affecting gfr you mention starling forces maybe in brackets you want to say uh, which they which in turn get affected by changes in renal blood flow and resistance of the glomerular efferent and efferent capillary network and number 2 uh, this quotient, glomerular capillary quotient or KF, we, we will we will talk about this as well. So this slide is the is the main slide when you're talking about factors affecting GFR. So now we 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 get this overview of starling forces across the glomerular membrane. As I mentioned, look, this is a simple schematic. It shows the afferent arteriole, the glomerulars, and the efferent arteriole. Okay. And in the glomerulus, he is showing glomerular hydrostatic pressure, and it's it shows it's it's 60 mmHg, which if you remember is around 30 to 35 in a normal capillary network. So this is clearly uh, significantly higher uh, than your uh, average capillary network. And then he shows uh, oncotic pressure, uh, colloid osmotic pressure. The values are here, um, and then. Uh, outside of this glomerulus, you have the Bauman capsule where he shows pressure. He just says capsule pressure. Basically, this is a hydrostatic pressure. So uh, first, just focus on these three. Uh, if, and if you remember the discussion of starling forces in circulation, you would remember that uh, there's, there is a fourth one. So there is hydrostatic pressure and colloid osmotic pressure. Then there's hydrostatic pressure 
What about the colloid pressure in the glomerular capsule? It's not mentioned here. We will we'll talk about this. So under this pressure, this hydrostatic pressure, high pressure, filtrate uh, plasma basically goes out of the glomerulus and comes in the Bauman capsule and uh, that filtration fraction that we talked about that is born. Okay, that is formed. And that causes the Bauman capsule pressure to also increase. So this pressure basically is because stuff is coming out of this capillary and collecting here, very importantly, temporarily. Okay, because remember what is beyond this boundary here. It's the tubule. So it's it's going to stay here for a bit only. It's going to it's it's continuously being drained. The fluid comes out and is drained into the uh, tubule, the renal tubule, and so on. So the temporary rise of pressure here is around this value. However, whatever this value is, it does tend to oppose because it's a hydrostatic pressure. It would put some sort of resistance uh, to the outcoming of uh, the fluid out from the glomerular capillary. Okay, and hence there there is a high, uh, there is a equilibrium in these two pressures. Uh, as you remember, oncotic pressure or colloid osmotic pressure is exerted by plasma proteins, and and since they are colloidal in nature, they would like to keep uh, keep a hold on their on their fluid and not let it go. Hence, it's an anti-filtration uh, pressure, and its value is 32 mmHg. I.e., this is the pressure that the plasma proteins exert within the blood, so that it doesn't. The, uh, the fluid doesn't go out okay so in the face of this pressure and this pressure again there is there is a balance here uh, which uh, keeps the formation of filtrate relatively constant now uh, coming to the point where is the oncotic pressure of Bauman capsule question mark question mark so basically uh, we don't have it because if you remember, we have a double membrane structure here, okay? And a double membrane structure means that we will not allow macromolecules to uh, come out beyond this uh, filtration barrier, okay? Hence, uh, it's uh, 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 very unlikely that any protein would come out uh, and roam around the Bauman capsule. Indeed, it's only... Uh, uh, C certain diseases which break this uh, filtration barrier and then you have a free fall and in, uh, of all sorts of proteins coming into the Bauman capsule and in that case it becomes operational that you need to then cal also consider Bauman capsule or, or uh, oncotic pressure but normally it should it should be so so less that it's negligible we don't even mention it okay so when you calculate the net filtration pressure which obviously is in favor of the hydrostatic pressure so obviously looking at cursory look at these numbers would tell you that stuff needs to should be coming out mathematically you just uh, use this equation you you put in the uh, glomerular hydrostatic pressure uh, you subtract the Bauman uh, capsular pressure from it and the main force these two are anti-filtration you just subtract them from the one pro filtration force you get a value of 10 mmhg and this 10 mmhg remember is uh, it, it looks like a small figure but it's it's not it is a continuous process it's uh, it's the pressure at which continuously 180 liters of your plasma is uh, going through these glomeruli of both kidneys and at a constant pressure of 10 mmHg stuff is coming out it's the sheer amount of blood that goes through this network that makes this apparently small amount of pressure it actually has a huge consequence if you know what I mean so Starling forces is is basically the generator of filtrate now Starling forces in turn get affected by very rashly speaking the amount of blood that you make available to them look starting forces would not be there if blood doesn't arrive inside the glomerulus 
the the starring forces are uh, it, are, are 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 things which are in the blood so blood exerts an hydrostatic pressure that's a starling force blood has oncotic pressure that is again by virtue of blood being there so what makes the availability of blood in the glomerulus is two things the the rate of glomerular uh, blood flow i.e how much are you allowing the blood to come in and the second which basically if you really look at it closely is related to uh, rbf is the resistance so it's the it's the collective or individual resistance of afferent arteriole and efferent arteriole which will determine renal blood flow okay so, um, i.e what what amount of blood is coming into the glomerulus and this in turn will effect with an e starling forces so it's the resistance of the capillary network affecting renal blood flow which affect starling forces which are forming gfr okay it's in this sequence if you really want to uh, study it as a linked process so these are the three scenarios but before going into them let me just introduce you to this uh, to this learning method so what he shows is uh, an afferent arteriole glomerulus and then efferent arteriole the rest is very labeled very clearly now look at this to show you the resistance he just uh, uh, shows this uh, nice little analogy of a screwing mechanism uh, and if you tighten the screws uh, this constricts and hence the resistance increases so if you can imagine uh, you can have a have a, a mechanism which constricts uh, afferent arteriole you can have uh, you you have a, a mechanism by which you can constrict the efferent arteriole or both okay so now <clears throat> let's first look at what 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 happens if you increase the resistance of the afferent arteriole now if you see and it's very clear that whatever the feeding artery was when it formed the afferent arteriole uh, the the flow of blood to the afferent arteriole in this situation where you have increased the resistance of afferent arteriole the the blood coming to this side will decrease and hence the glomerular flow of blood will decrease in this uh, uh, in this example so increasing the resistance of afferent arteriole or in simple words vasoconstriction of afferent arteriole will decrease the rbf the renal blood flow which will decrease the gfr right what is the inter uh, uh, what is the uh, agent which agent of the starling forces affects this uh, decrease in gfr the hydrostatic pressure naturally less blood less rpf in the glomerulus less capillary hydrostatic pressure which is the main filtration ag filtration agent and hence less the gfr okay this is very clear and simple this is this however is a bit more complex uh, uh, increase resistance of the efferent arteriole so in this example remember these are very important viva questions and mcqs are formed here on this based on this material so f in afferent you just vasoconstricted the afferent arteriole here you vasoconstrict the efferent arteriole now this has all sorts of consequences so um, don't be confused by this we will explain it in a bit so imagine that normal blood was passing through now i'm explaining this uh, scenario here okay uh, normal blood was passing through the afferent in the glomerulus and then blood was being drained out of the efferent arteriole 20 percent filtration fraction was being formed as we studied at the glomerulus and the 80 percent of blood was escaping through the efferent arteriole now what you do is you vasoconstrict the efferent arteriole mildly you see there is a, co a complexity here there are two sub scenarios in this scenario in this scenario one is mild constriction of the efferent arteriole and then there is a severe constriction of the efferent arteriole first let's work out the mild constriction now imagine if the efferent arteriole is mildly constricted what will happen 
to the blood flow. The blood flow would decrease. You have just increased the resistance of the escape vessel. So obviously, and you haven't done anything to the, very importantly, you haven't done anything to the afferent arterio. It's, it's, uh, it's the same. So if you, in this whole system of blood coming here and through this and then escaping, if you increase the resistance here, what you are doing is you are trapping blood in the glomerulus. And then you are also, by trapping blood here in the glomerulus, you are basically decreasing the fresh incoming blood, right? Because there is damping of blood here in raising the hydrostatic pressure. So the incoming blood, the, de the delta P would decrease and blood coming into the glomerulus will decrease eventually when effect of this efferent vasoconstriction takes place. I hope this is clear. Under this increased uh, hydrostatic pressure, GFR will increase. I'll say it again in one sentence. In va mildly vasoconstricting the efferent arteriole increases GFR by increasing the capillary hydrostatic pressure. However, overall, the renal blood flow has decreased in this scenario. Okay. Very important. This, this can be asked in a, in a tricky way uh, by the examiner. He can ask you, uh, give me a scenario where renal blood flow decreases, however, GFR increases. Now, to the unprepared student, this can be a, a, a very off-throwing question because uh, rationally speaking, for GFR to increase, you need to have increase in renal blood flow. That's the straight equation, right? But in this particular efferent arteriole scenario, which I told you is tricky, what happens is it does increase, GFR increases, but the overall blood flow through the whole system has actually decreased. And you know now what's happening. Okay, so you've done the mild vasoconstriction. What about severe vasoconstriction of the efferent arteriole? What happens then? So it's not shown here, but if you really constrict it, seriously constrict it, almost occlude it, what will happen? What will happen is renal blood flow will, will further decrease, yes, and the blood trapped here will have nowhere to go, okay? When it has nowhere to go, it will become static here. There is stasis, no flow of blood will take place. Now, the initial increase in the hydrostatic pressure, which resulted in increased GFR, obviously, it will have a limit because there is no fresh blood flowing inside. Imagine that the blood trapped here is just trapped because, and now the efferent arteriole constriction is so severe that it cannot really move at all. So the stuff that had to be, uh, that could, fil could be filtered out has actually filtered out during the mild efferent constriction phase. That filtrate part has already become GFR. What is left behind is less liquidy portion of the blood and more cellular portion of the blood. So the hematocrit would increase, won't you agree? You have removed already the filtration fraction, leaving behind the, the, the blood is thicker, quote unquote, hematocrit is more. So which pressure will increase in this situation? Which stalling force will increase? If your answer is colloidal osmotic pressure will increase because plasma proteins will be concentrated per unit of blood, then your answer is correct. And, and because of increase of colloid osmotic pressure, <clears throat> eventually the GFR will decrease. I'll say that in a sentence. So increasing efferent arteriolar constriction severely raises the plasma colloid osmotic pressure of the glomerular capillary blood, decreasing GFR in a scenario of decreased renal blood flow. Severe decreased renal blood flow, okay? Now, final point is uh, saying it in one sentence. This is called the biphasic effect, D-I, P-H-A-S-I-C, biphasic, i.e. two phases. So in efferent arterial vasoconstriction, mild 
efferent arterial reconstriction leads to increased GFR, while severe efferent arterial reconstriction leads to decrease in GFR. Okay, that's done. I hope you understood that. Uh, a final point here is this is not a this is not a theoretical exercise. Actually, what happens is a a a chemical called angiotensin two, and we'll talk about this in in this lecture later on. Angiotensin two is some is a, is is something that is formed in the blood, and since it's formed, obviously, while it's forming, its amount in the blood is at first is low. Okay, and it's a vasoconstrictor, and it sort of likes the efferent arteriolar arteriole more than afferent arteriole. So initially, even at low plasma concentrations, it has a vasoconstrictor effect on the efferent arteriole. And as its amount in the blood raises further, the amount of vasoconstriction, the degree of vasoconstriction increases. So at high levels of angiotensin two. The efferent arteriole really chokes up, which we met, which we mentioned that it is severe in vasoconstriction. So let me now say it in a sentence which mentions angiotensin two. At low concentrations of angiotensin two, brackets uh, mild vasoconstriction of the efferent arteriole, GFR is increased. Right. While at higher angiotensin two in brackets, severe vasoconstriction of the efferent arteriole GFR is decreased. Okay, hope that is that is clear. This scenario you need to work out yourself. We have actually dilated uh, the afferent arteriole while the rest is constant. What will happen to the stalling force? What will happen to the uh, GFR? Uh, and overall uh, under under uh, what value would uh, renal blood flow would be i would uh, look up the uh, comment section below uh, for students who work this out okay so having having dealt with stalling forces number 2 is filtration quotient filtration quotient very simply put is basically the overall status of your glomerular membrane uh, what is its permeability? So there are there are there are conditions, diseases in which this permeability decreases, and then there are other uh, uh, inflammatory uh, diseases being one of them, which may cause an increase in permeability of the glomerular membrane capillary. You can imagine if the permeability say increases, then the GFR would increase, right? Uh, uh, multiplied by uh, surface area. So there are. There are diseases in which there is loss of glomerular membrane. So in, in that, in that uh, the surface area actually has decreased. Uh, so if you have a decrease in area of surface area across which the filtration is happening, naturally the, uh, the GFR would decrease. It's just like the respiratory membrane, uh, which we, you studied under respiratory physiology in first year. If you, if you have a normal respiratory membrane surface area, the alveolar exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide is normal between blood and alveoli. But if you have a decrease in surface area, then you will have decreased uh, uh, ventilation and decreased uh, gas exchange. Same is the case with permeability. If there is a gas in, in, uh, in uh, respiration, if there's a gas which has more permeability, it will go across more. If it has less permeability, it will go across less. So filtration membranes uh, physiology and respiratory membranes physiology is is is, is very very same similar uh, in terms of its physics. This is a normal value of KF 12.5. Look at the very interesting uh, unit here. So it's milliliter per minute per unit pressure. Okay, so it encapsulates both of these factors. Okay, moving on. Uh, we now describe the third and probably the most asked and most quoted aspect of GFR, how is it regulated? Now, before we jump into the, uh, to the nitty gritty, uh, let me uh, comment on why is it so important? Look, GFR is what will make the filtrate, right? And the filtrate will go on to make the urine. Okay. So where does the filtrate come from? Well, the filtrate comes from the blood 
and in the blood it comes out of the plasma okay where does this blood come from it comes from the feeding arteries of the kidneys architecture where does that come from it comes from the renal artery the main artery where does the renal artery come from it comes from the descending aorta and now you know where this story is going okay so fluctuations in arterial blood pressure again fluctuation in arterial blood pressure can affect and does affect uh, an organ's blood flow or perfusion, right? We have all sorts of local blood flow controls at the level of tissues. Again, you studied it, studied it in circulation under local blood flow control. So in, in you must have read there that kidney, renal blood flow is, is exquisitely auto-regulated. The word auto-regulation must have gone through or must have come through in your studies. So you cannot have a situation where our fluctuating arterial blood pressure, which by the way doesn't fluctuate much anyway, but it does fluctuate uh, between this when you're awake, when you're asleep, your posture, uh, when you exercise, it does fluctuate during uh, uh, your daily routine activities not too much though however it does fluctuate so fluctuating arterial blood pressure if you have no system of keeping gfr constant in the face of a fluctuating uh, arterial blood pressure i.e the feeding pressure keeps on fluctuating and if you don't have a safety net inside the kidney what will happen what will happen is as soon as the blood pressure increases you will have increased gfr right and if you have increased gfr now if you put in that statistic that i mentioned uh, the daily statistic that if you uh, do not reabsorb 19% uh, of the 20 units of uh, uh, the 20% filtration fraction if you don't reabsorb 99% of it ie most of it then what will happen is your urine volume will increase so I usually give this very interesting, funny example of you exercising. So imagine you going for a run. What will happen? You go for a run and you push it, i.e. you run fast, very fast. The, the blood pressure starts going up. The renal perfusion starts going up. Yes. And if the GFR is not auto-regulated, it doesn't behave uh, in the face of this uh, fluctuating naughty blood pressure what will happen is the filtration amount the amount of filtrate that is formed will increase the tubular uh, network has only so much capacity okay it has a finite capacity so it will try to reabsorb most of it but the pressure will be so much the amount of filtrate that you're forming is just so much that it won't be able to cope resulting in increased urine formation so as soon as you start to really push it in exercise you will end up you know where okay uh, sober comments are invited on this point tell me where will you end up uh, if this is the case okay okay so point is gfr needs to be regulated and it does that's the good news. So this again is a is an SEQ uh, roadmap for you. If somebody asks you how is GFR regulated, uh, the convention, however, is that you are asked specifically about auto regulation, i.e., or myogenic mechanism or TGA. Okay. So uh, from uh, the SEQ perspective, you would be asked specifics because. Uh, they have to uh, condense uh, the question focused on five marks. That's their limitation. So they, they cannot ask you really the whole, the whole uh, shebang. They need to ask, they need to ask you something which they can justify for five marks or less. Okay. So from an SAQ point of view, you need to understand that you'll be looking at this part of this roadmap. Auto regulation, you need to know very, very clearly. Uh, however, in a viva, you, you can be asked a broader question. Obviously, it's verbal. You can be asked that, okay, 
tell us uh, how the GFR is regulated, then you say that, okay, there are two main uh, uh, components to it, an intrinsic component and there is an extrinsic component, okay? And intrinsic, in the intrinsic component, you have auto regulation. And in auto regulation, you have myogenic and da da da. While in extrinsic mechanism, you have nerves, basically sympathetics, and you have various hormones uh, uh, running around, which also may affect uh, the GFR. But remember, if you're asked which is the most important mechanism of GFR regulation, it's this intrinsic auto regulation. Okay? Now, look at this. This is probably one of the broadest ranges you have studied in physiology up till now. 80 to 180 mmHg. So what does it say? That if you, remember I was just talking about fluctuating the arterial blood pressure? This is the range. It's very impressive. If you were to fluctuate arterial blood pressure, and we are talking about mean arterial blood pressure. I hope you still remember some of your circulation. You haven't forgotten everything. That mean arterial pressure is the value is around is basically 95 to 100 let's say 100 okay if you drop it to 80 or if you increase it to 180 gfr will still be hovering around 125 ml per minute that's the beauty of auto regulation so you can now appreciate such a wild swing in arterial blood flow does not really impress the gfr it stays relatively constant how is that feat even possible through these two mechanisms? In the graphical form, look at this. The mean arterial pressure is constantly increasing from 40 to 80, then from 80 to 180, and then 180 and onwards. So as I said, between 80 and 180, you will have autoregulation. So from 40 to 80, the GFR did increase. Okay, this is per day. It's in liters per day. So if you have a mean arterial pressure going up to 80 mmHg, you will have increase in GFR from 40. Now from 80 to 180, you will have a constant GFR. This is this is auto regulation. This is auto regulation. But of course, with everything, there is a there are limits. And beyond 180, if you still increase the arterial blood pressure, then GFR will start to go up and all sorts of issues will come into play. And if you decrease blood pressure below 80, all sorts of problems on the everything decreasing side will come into play. So GFR will decrease, urine output will decrease, uh, uh, fluid will be retained inside the uh, body, uh, the other functions of the kidney, osmoregulation and pH balance, all sorts of problems will start to happen. Okay. This is it this happens when the renal when the kidney shut starts shutting down. Okay. So this is that. Now we'll we'll start one by one what happens. So we are now be uh, going after auto regulation and the first uh, stop is myogenic mechanism. Now myogenic mechanism I'll just explain it on this graph. You can write a small paragraph when you're asked this in your uh, professional exams. <clears throat> Look at this graph. Look at, um, say this first, GFR. So GF, this is the, really essentially the same diagram as this, okay? In which GFR is shown as a function of mean arterial pressure. This diagram, however, is, is a bit more specific. Here, GFR is given in relation with renal blood flow. So uh, we are, we, we in, of course, renal blood flow is a function of mean arterial pressure, but we haven't shown it here. We are showing that when you increase renal blood flow to a certain point, till a certain point, GFR will oblige, which will increase. But beyond that, beyond that increase, if you keep on increasing the renal blood flow, GFR will flatten out. Okay. Uh, and th then you, of course, have uh, renal arterial uh, renal arterial pressure here as well. So it's not arterial blood pressure, but it's the same thing because renal arterial pressure reflects the pressure of the systemic circulation. So everything basically flattens out beyond this 80, around 80 mark 
of ATMMAG mark. The renal blood flow flattens out. Okay, so the, it won't increase uh, beyond 80, and hence GFR will not increase beyond 80. Okay, so this is very clear. Both graphs actually look quite similar, and hence it's very evident that beyond 80, something happens in the in the very vasculature of the uh, glomerulus which resists any change further change in renal blood flow and hence uh, any change in significant change in gfr okay so what is that change i would like you to look at the blue curve now look at this blue curve it's labeled as afferent arteriolar resistance i want you to give it a good look and correlate it with these two graphs right so now let's study this you are increasing renal arterial pressure you are increasing blood pressure let's say as you are increasing blood pressure look at what is happening to the blue graph as it increases hits the 80 mark below 80 it's uh, it's really under 0.5 it really doesn't really change much however as you hit the 80 mark and above resistance graph really takes up it really goes up what are we saying we are saying that the afferent arteriole is vasoconstricting yes increase resistance means vasoconstriction so in afferent arteriole there is vasoconstriction beyond a pressure which is 80 mag in the feeding artery okay and it hits a top while there's no not much difference in the efferent arteriole it's basically the efferent arteriole the the gatekeeper of blood flow into the glomerular tuft of capillaries the blood comes from the efferent arteriole isn't it that's the gatekeeper so if it's vas it, if it vasoconstricts it will not let blood come into the glomerulus and hence gfr will be saved your glomerular tuft of capillary, which is, by the way, very fragile, it is saved structurally. And the physiological consequence of the whole thing, filtration, etc., etc., GFR, is also saved. So this arteriolar constriction keeps the renal blood flow constant. Beyond 80, you see that it flattens out. So you can say that if afferent arteriole has sacrificed, it has constricted, taken the load on itself, keeping renal blood flow constant. And if renal blood flow is constant, GFR just knows renal blood flow. GFR doesn't need to know what is happening uh, in renal artery or afferent arteriole. It just needs to know how much blood is coming in, how much I have to deal with. Okay. And hence the GFR is constant. Okay. This is the myogenic mechanism. This is what happens when you increase the back pressure of a, of a vessel. Uh, it goes into vasoconstriction. You have studied this myogenic mechanism in circulation in your first year. Okay. So basically, just to recap quickly, do you are supposed to read up that section of circulation where it discusses myogenic mechanism in detail. Uh, in summary, basically vascular smooth muscle goes into contraction when it faces a sudden surge of pressure okay when there is a sudden surge of pressure vascular smooth muscle of arterioles specifically goes into contraction so as to res resist any damaging changes in wall pressure we also called it shear s h e a r shear is a, 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 a single word for uh, wall tension so to resist any damaging wall tension vessels go into vasoconstriction so as to resist pressure changes okay uh, you may also have read the law of laplace in this in this context let me just tell you the the law uh, wall tension is equal to uh, pressure across the wall multiplied by radius okay once again Laplace law is wall tension it's directly proportional to the pressure which is being exerted on the wall and 
the radius of the vessel. So by vasoconstriction, as an example, what are you doing? You are decreasing the radius, hence decreasing the tension on the wall. Look up Laplace law as well. Okay. You may also want to uh, look up my first year lecture on uh, regional blood flow uh, and, and, the, uh, and the physics of uh, blood flow, uh, the initial chapters of uh, the initial video recordings of uh, circulation. And I discussed the Laplace law there uh, in, in some detail. Ha, huh, okay. So this is the myogenic mechanism. This is the first uh, 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 mechanism of how autoregulation takes place. The second, these things are uh, more simple. You have already looked at this architecture. I, I paste it here because A, I just love this diagram. It's beautiful. It shows you the internal structure uh, of the glomerulus and, and the podocytes and all this sort of thing. Uh, and then it shows you the afferent arteriole uh, and efferent arteriole. And this is where the DCT loops back and comes close and then loops back away from it and forms the collecting duct. I remember I've mentioned this already in the functional anatomy class. And look at this, uh, the cells that are facing the afferent and the efferent arteriole. They are the uh, macula densa. And then the cells of the visceral uh, smooth muscle of the afferent arteriole and the efferent, but more on the afferent side, they specialize to become the JG cells. Okay, this is important. This whole thing here, macula densa plus JG cells of the afferent and yes, the efferent, they form the juxta glomerular apparatus. The okay, juxta glomerular apparatus. And I probably have mentioned that <clears throat> the macula densa is looking inwards. So they sense sodium chloride concentration inside the, the filtrate that is arriving in the distal convoluted tubule, and they're sensitive to the sodium chloride concentrations, especially the sodium concentration. And if there is any fluctuation in it, they, they sense it, they give the signal to the JG cells and appropriate responses uh, 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 take place in the JG cells. Okay, now what are, what are those responses? This is, uh, this we discussed today. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so we were discussing uh, TG balance, tubular glomerular feedback mechanism. Uh, this is a continuation of this diagram and my discussion on JG apparatus. Okay, so look at this diagram. And remember, this is an independent UQ. Uh, if they don't give anything from this section, they may certainly give you tubular glomerular balance. Basically this graph, uh, this uh, flow chart. So look at the scenario. So the arterial blood pressure, they say, uh, say it uh, decreases, okay? Um, this will result in glomerular hydrostatic pressure to drop. If the glomerular hydrostatic pressure to drop, this is, we are assuming no autoregulation uh, is taking place, all right? So if in case of no autoregulation, there's a free fall, or you drop the arterial pressure, all sorts of problems come uh, to the hydrostatic pressure, it drops as well. And since this is the main determinant of the GFR, the GFR goes down. And now what happens? <clears throat> when the GFR goes down, uh, the amount of filtrate that is formed decreases. Okay? Just focus on what I'm saying. Decreasing GFR will decrease the amount of filtrate formation. Yes? Yes. And when this decreased filtrate will go through the proximal convoluted tubule where there is the most amount of sodium chloride reabsorption taking place normally, its velocity will drop. When you have more fluid formation, the velocity goes up, right? If you have less filtrate formation, the velocity goes down, right? Now, in this case, since the filtration is not happening uh, properly to its maximum uh, uh, extent, what will happen to the velocity? The velocity will go down. The, in a, uh, said in another way, the filtrate passes more time through the proximal convoluted tubule because the velocity is less. It will have more time to sort of waddle through the uh, proximal convoluted tubule. 
So the machinery which is picking up sodium chloride will say, hey, this wagon has slowed down. Let's take more sodium chloride out of it. So sodium chloride gets more reabsorbed than usual. So when it eventually arrives at the macula densa, while it, it used to be normal in its sodium chloride concentration, when everything was fine, in this case, in the decreased GFR scenario, because of the velocity, etc., that I just mentioned, the sodium chloride pickup at the PCT proximal quantity tribute is increased, leading to a less sodium chloride arriving at the macula densa. Okay, now I've, I've mentioned in the earlier slide and earlier in functional anatomy as well that macula densa basically senses sodium chloride concentration mainly the sodium concentration. Okay, <clears throat> this is the signal that macula densa then gives the JG cells. If I just uh, take you back to the diagram, this. So this is the tubular fluid that has arrived, which is deficient in sodium chloride. Macula densa picks this up. And when macula densa picks it up, uh, it gives the signal to its very nearby cousins, the JG cells. So the signal goes to the JG cells that, look, sodium chloride is less. Okay, there must be something wrong with GFR. JG cells of the afferent and some of the efferent, mainly the afferent, they start secreting renin. Now, renin is already pre-made in these within these cells and it is released at a constant rate inside the afferent arterio. So renin is, is made here, is already formed here, and whatever is formed, it's released into the blood coming in the afferent arteriole, and then it hits the systemic circulation, right? In this case, when you have decreased GFR, decreased NSCL at macula densa, the rate of renin secretion increases. Remember, it is not zero normally either. It's there. Some of it gets released. Okay. Uh, the rate of secretion of renin increases in this scenario. Now, what does renin do? Renin is basically an enzyme. And it's, uh, you again have studied this in circulation. I keep on referring you to circulation. You have studied this. You read about this. And what does it do in circulation, in blood pressure regulation? Long term blood pressure regulation, you have read, you've read this. Renin is the enzyme which converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Okay, you need renin for that. Now, angiotensin 2, 1, converts into angiotensin 2 in the lungs under the influence of an enzyme over there. The enzyme over there is angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE. A C E. ACE is the enzyme which converts angiotensin 1 formed by renin in, into the operational uh, compound or hormone angiotensin 2. It's this angiotensin 2 as the name indicates angiotensin. Angio means vessel, tensin means tension. So angiotensin 2 is one of the most powerful vasoconstrictors naturally made by the body. So as soon as you start to increase angiotensin 2 level in blood, what happens is all sorts of vasoconstrictions take place. Angiotensin 2, before I move on, angiotensin 2 is a vasoconstrictor for all of the body. So remember that it has been released in this scenario, a decrease in arterial blood pressure. So immediately you can, you can appreciate that if you now are making an indigenous compound on its own, on the body is making it within it, which will vasoconstrict artery, arteries, it will improve arterial blood pressure. Okay, so angiotensin 2 in arterial blood pressure, uh, you studied it under uh, intermediate uh, mechanisms. Angiotensin 2 basically improves arterial blood pressure because it's a, vaso, it's a general vasoconstrictor. Now, since we are discussing uh, renal, its role in renal physiology, <clears throat> we will just focus on what it does in within the renal, uh, the kidney in this scenario. 
So angiotensin II basically constricts the efferent arteriole and causes the biphasic effect, which I have just mentioned earlier, at low concentrations and then at high concentrations. Please connect it with that concept over there. And <clears throat> basically at milder concentration, it basically does this and raises it, raises the glomerular hydrostatic pressure, raises a GFR and everybody is happy. Okay. At, uh, by the way, at, at, at high concentrations, it, it also vasoconstricts the afferent and then eventually brings the whole system uh, down back to normal, which is not evident in Guyton's flowchart. Okay. <clears throat> Something that you need to note. It's a regulatory mechanism, but it also needs regulation. So too much of this will in itself be a problem. You need to then vasoconstrict the afferent to bring the whole system back down to normal. He's, he has mentioned something uh, here, which is a decreased macular denser NACL has a vasodilatory effect at the afferent. I have not found this and uh, I mentioned it to my students. I, this is, is not mentioned in uh, any standard textbook that uh, I have gone through, but Guyton mentions it. And so you need to, you need to make a note of it that macular densa decreased sodium chloride <clears throat> has two wings. One is this famous well-documented uh, phenomena, which eventually vasoconstricts the efferent, but it seems to also, according to Guyton, it seems to also have a direct effect on vasodilation of the uh, arteriole, uh, afferent arteriole, which obviously, obviously has a beneficial effect in increasing the hydrostatic pressure. Uh, you need to discuss this under these two headings if this comes as a SEQ. So this is done. You have done the TG balance. Some uh, footnotes is uh, there are other renin secretors, uh, uh, which is the perfusion pressure <clears throat> of kidney. If kidney's perfusion pressure decreases, this in itself can cause a, a renal, uh, uh, re a renal renin secretion. So what we're talking about is if the afferent arterial here, the pressure drops, it has a physical effect on renin release. It causes more release of renin. And then there is sympathetic stimulation. You know that I mentioned that sympathetics are uh, uh, richly supplied at uh, around about the afferent arteriole. Uh, so if there is stimulation of the sympathetics, again, that also has a direct effect on renal uh, renin secretion. <clears throat> so th this is the two points which you can log away uh, alongside renin. <clears throat> good, good, by, good students are sometimes asked while they are discussing TG balance and renin comes up, the examiner may ask, are there any other uh, ways of increasing renin secretion? This is where this information comes in handy. Other is another point of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, cl the clinical application of, of this is ACE inhibitors. These are drugs, uh, ACE is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors means we are stopping the enzyme to work. So we are basically stopping <clears throat> angiotensin II formation. Uh, in certain hypertensives, this, these are very oftenly prescribed in mild hypertensives uh, to bring their uh, hypertension down. It, you may find it strange because you have just studied the wonderful, wonderful function of angiotensin II. However, in, uh, uh, in hypertension, which in itself is a huge issue, uh, you need to do something uh, which brings back the blood pressure down or, or sort of offsets the high blood pressure that the patient is suffering from. And you may want to inhibit angiotensin II, which is a vasoconstrictor, and provide relief uh, to the patient. Uh, another class of drugs are angiotensin II antagonists. Antagonist is, a, is an agent which competes with, its, with, with, uh, with the compound that uh, it needs to compete with. So there are drugs which compete with angiotensin II, does not let it uh, connect with its receptor and cause vasoconstriction, and hence uh, the resultant is vasodilation. And hence this, this, these both class of drugs improve hypertension, improves high blood pressure in hypertension. So they are, they are good agents. However, a caution needs to be uh, given here that these drugs, uh, since they are uh, uh, meddling with the affairs of angiotensin II, may uh, result in fluctuation of GFR. So if the, if the patients, if the hypertensive patients 
kidney is all right, then by all means use these drugs. <clears throat> but if the kidney and the GFR is affected in this hypertensive, which is not the case with all hypertensives, then a word of caution needs to be given uh, to maybe use it under mo uh, monitoring uh, the patient, i.e. in admitted patients, or use some other drug to, to handle the hypertension and not these drugs because in a, in a, in a kidney compromised person, a hypertensive, giving these drugs would plummet the GFR and cause all sorts of issues with the renal output, shutting down the kidney and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, uh, concluding remarks about autoregulation, it's absent below 80, 90, 80 to 90 mmHg. It's not perfect. Uh, <clears throat> things do change a bit with changing blood pressure. Uh, this is the end of intrinsic uh, with extrinsic. Uh, I'll just skim through this sympathetic stimulation. I've already spoken about there are naturally occurring or in, uh, exogenous vasodilators. Uh, these are vasodilators and vasoconstrictors, it should say. Both are vasodilators, I beg your pardon. So <clears throat> I don't know why there are two headings here. So there are vasodilators which improve or increase uh, the uh, what you call uh, the blood flow. There are sympathetic stimulation which 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 would constrict the blood flow. Uh, an interesting uh, observation is again this: people who are who are who are on high protein diet, they they tend to get uh, more uh, GFR. Uh, same is the case with the early onset uh, diabetes mellitus, where there is high glucose entering into the filtrate. Uh, both of these effects. Let me just uh, give a shot at it. Hope you remember it. High protein diet means the guy is having a lot of, of protein in his diet all the time, which then leads to uh, high uh, uh, amino acid and protein peptide content of the filtrate that is being formed at the kidney. Now, when this uh, filtrate hits the proximal coronary tubule, uh, it somehow increases the reabsorption of sodium. So it needs to be reabsorbed. The extra amino acids need to be reclaimed by the kit, by the body. So they are reabsorbed. But alongside, they also uh, it, this also facilitates sodium uptake, sodium chloride uptake. Again, the same effect happens uh, that the filtrate now is deficient in sodium chloride. And when it arrives at the macula densa, the whole uh, TG balance phenomena takes place. But if, if you can appreciate, this is happening while the GFR is fine. It's not the GFR that triggered this response. It's the high protein content by meddling it with sodium chloride reabsorption by increasing it. It are sort of quote, quote unquote artificially <clears throat> activated the macula densa. So we say that in, in a sentence, we say that high protein diet people uh, have, a, have a high sensitivity of the macula densa uh, mechanism. They triggered their macular tensor mechanism, renin is secreted, angiotensin is secreted, and the GFR is enhanced even more. So they have high uh, GFR uh, scenario. Uh, same is the case with uh, extra glucose entering into the filtrate. Uh, it also enhances the sodium uptake, and the same case happens in early diabetics. Okay. Uh, so this, this basically uh, concludes uh, today's presentation. As is the tradition uh, of these lectures, I do give a clinical snippet, a case uh, at the end. And today that case is uh, diabetic nef uh, nephropathy. And uh, diabetes, uh, you know, is, uh, is sort of a pandemic in its own right, in, not in the strict sense, but <clears throat> in the sense that uh, uh, basically Western diet, this junk food business, uh, uh, and sedentary lifestyles, uh, not you know, people not going out for walks and exercise and just sitting in one place. It has really increased this uh, pandemic of uh, obesity. And I'm using the word pandemic loosely here. And uh, with uh, obesity rising, uh, diabetes is linked with that, uh, unless it's type 1, which is basically uh, red free. Type 2 is almost... Uh, uh, in majority of its cases is linked with obesity. So with diabetes, you have all sorts of issues. Today, since we are discussing kidney, diabetes also affects the kidneys. Okay. Now, 
we are picking up uh, a diabetic who is a advanced diabetic and the kidneys uh, after initial damage and then more damage and then more damage now have come to an end stage it actually is called end stage renal disease okay uh, uh, esr d uh, so in that disease uh, the kidney starts to fail it's a life threatening complication in the majority of type 1 diabetics also uh, a significant number of type 2 diabetics what happens what happens in diabetic nephropathy nephro, nephro means kidney pathy means disease nephropathy what happens is initially there is an increase in gfr this this happens because uh, high glucose content of the blood disturbs the endothelial cells so if you remember the fenestrae of the endothelium in the glomerular membrane they would even in 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 this scenario <clears throat> under the irritation of high glucose all the time they would further become leaky initially okay which would then raise the uh, the gfr uh, so much so that proteins will start to pour out into the filtrate we call it proteinuria you will have when you go for a urine analysis of this patient you will have proteins in this uh, in the urine of this patient which obviously is abnormal <clears throat> however as the nephropathy goes uh, further develops the gfr actually decreases why does it decrease because uh, constant uh, hitting uh, the endothelium it starts to then become thick the endothelium becomes thick then basement membrane becomes thick again we don't exactly know precisely what are the mechanisms of this thickening but it's an observation that it does thicken which then uh, leads to decrease filtration across the membrane leading to decrease gfr uh, so if you decrease gfr you're not filtering uh, the blood which you need to filter then the patient needs dialysis which is artificial filtration and <clears throat> linked to a dialysis machine which does the work of the kidney and eventually these patients go on to complete renal failure failure in which they need to uh, get a kidney transplant so this is a nice uh, feature uh, nice uh, disease uh, not, not nice disease but a disease which nicely uh, focuses on uh, the importance of gfr these are the references uh, and inshallah see you uh, tomorrow with part two of the gfr inshallah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh